when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, he taught that each one of them has a duty. The first Noble Truth, the truth of stress and suffering, is to be comprehended. The second, the cause of suffering, is to be abandoned. The third, the cessation of suffering is to be realized, is to be realized. And the fourth, the path to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. Now those duties are not totally independent of one another. The more you develop the path, the easier it's going to be to comprehend suffering and to complete all the other duties. That's because as you develop the path, and particularly as you work on concentration, you get to see what's going on in the mind a lot more clearly. And if you ask the right questions, which is what right view is all about, you can come to understand things that have been happening in your mind all along that you simply haven't noticed or haven't looked at in the right way. When you look at them in the right way, then you can put it into suffering. And the fact that we're developing the path gives us some insight into the truth of suffering in particular, because we're going to be engaged in what the Buddha calls five aggregates. There's form, which is your body, and it's sitting here right now. There are feelings. You've got feelings in the body right now. And you're trying to generate feelings of ease, feelings of well-being. It's by trying to generate them that you understand them. You don't simply watch them come and go. You try to develop what the Buddha calls feelings not of the flesh. There's the pain not of the flesh, which is the realization that there are people who have gained awakening, but you haven't gained awakening yet. So there's work to be done. That's a painful thought. You can't just sit around and relax. But it's a painful thought that's useful. It's like the tension on a bow and a bow and arrow. If there's no tension on the string, the arrow's not going to go anywhere. And their perceptions. These are the labels the mind has, which can be either images or words, saying this is this and that's that. This looks like this, looks like looks like that. And here you're going to apply the perception to the breath. When the breath comes in, where does it come in? When it goes out, where does it go out? What's happening as you breathe in? What ha what's happening as you breathe out? What's a good perception to hold in mind so you can get the mind to settle down? Because you are trying to develop right concentration through right mindfulness and right effort. And concentration is going to require a perception that you hold in mind continually. And you would hold in mind a perception that allows the breath to feel comfortable, because you are trying to create those feelings of pleasure, feelings of ease. So think of the breath as a whole body process. All the nerves, all the blood vessels are breathing in together. Every little muscle, down to the tiny muscles inside the walls of the blood vessels, they're all working together as you breathe in and as you breathe out. And where you feel any tension or blockage, just think of it dissolving away. Or if you can't think of it dissolving, think of the breath going around it, going through it. And the thinking you're doing here is not just perceptions. You're going to be talking to yourself, and that's where fabrication comes in, which is the fourth aggregate. You're directing your thoughts to the breath, and you're evaluating how it's going. You evaluate the breath, you evaluate the state of your mind right now. Is it ready to settle down? Work with the breath for a while and see how it feels. And if the mind refuses to settle down, maybe the problem's not with the breath, maybe it's with the mind. This is where you may have to do a little detour. Think in ways that incline the mind to want to settle down. If you're carrying in issues from the day about who said what to you and how you don't like it, 
just think thoughts of goodwill. There's no need to carry those narratives into the meditation right now. May that person be happy. May you be happy. If you're feeling discouraged, think about all those stories from the Theragata and the Therigata of monks and nuns who are almost suicidal sometimes. So frustrated they were that they wouldn't, their minds wouldn't settle down. And yet they were able to come to their senses and get their minds to settle down and gain awakening. So even when things look bleak, they're not always going to be bleak. Remind yourself of that. And that every little chip that you can take out of this wall of defilement is a chip in the right direction. So the mind will be more confident that, yes, this is something that can be done. It may take time, but it's an important task. And it's not the kind of task where you say, well, I only have so much time to give to this because I've got other responsibilities. Those other responsibilities pale in comparison to the need to train the mind. This should come first. So you learn how to think in ways that allow the mind to settle down. Then you go back to evaluating the breath. What kind of breath would feel really good right now, satisfying, gratifying? Which parts of the body seem to be starved for breath, thirsty for breath? Well, give them a good, nourishing breath. Think of the breath going to those parts of the body until you find a part of the body that's extremely sensitive and is very gratified when the breath feels good there. Focus there. Let that be your gauge for what kind of breathing would be best for the body right now. Then think of that sense of well-being spreading from that spot with no boundaries. Then, of course, you're aware of doing all these things. That's the fifth aggregate, which is consciousness. So you've got all the aggregates right here. And that's an important step in learning how to comprehend suffering. As you develop concentration, you're getting ready to comprehend suffering more and more. Because the Buddha didn't say something useless like, life is suffering or something bland and also useless, that there is suffering. Sometimes you hear people say, well, all you have to do is acknowledge the fact that suffering is there, and that's what it means to comprehend suffering. Well, that's not the case. The Buddha said suffering is the five clinging aggregates, which means not that the aggregates are clinging, but the act of clinging to the aggregates. So when there's pain, that's a feeling. But that's not necessarily the suffering that's going on in the mind or the suffering the Buddha is talking about. He's talking about the suffering that comes when you cling. And you may be clinging to your sense of the body. You may be clinging to a particular feeling. And to cling, you need to have certain perceptions and certain thoughts. So a lot of times the clinging comes down to perceptions and fabrications. And of course, you may be clinging simply to the fact that you want to be aware of something, anything. So you grab at whatever you've got. You can either cling to things as they are or cling to the idea of how you would like them to be. And it's good to look into how you perceive things as they are. Say there's a pain in the body. How do you perceive that? How does your awareness relate to the pain? How does the pain relate to the body? We've been dealing with pain ever since we were little children. In fact, so little that we had no language at all when we first encountered pain. We didn't know we didn't like it. And our sense of how you might deal with pain, keep it from overcoming the body, can often date back to that pre-verbal area. So you're going to have to ask some questions that are kind of pre-verbal. Is the pain the same thing as the body? And part of the mind, of course, will say no. But there may be part of the mind that says yes, which is what the problem is. You've got the body and the pain glommed together. 
So learn to see them as two separate things. Then there's your awareness. How do you perceive the relationship between your awareness and the pain? You have to remind yourself the pain is not aware of anything at all. It just is the result of certain events in the body, events in the mind. But it's not aware of anything. It has no intention. So you try to ferret out your perceptions around the pain, and you can see exactly what it is you're clinging to. Especially when you're trying to see what kind of perceptions you're clinging to. Propose different perceptions. Like if you have a sense that the pain is one solid block, say, in your hip or in your knee. Ask yourself, is it really all that solid? This is where you start using the Buddha's three perceptions. Is there some inconstancy to the pain? Does it go up? Does it go down? If it does, what happens? What did the mind do? And how about the sense of being pained in the mind? Does that go up and down, too? Well, yes, it certainly does. Well, why is that? Sometimes it may be because you paid attention someplace else. Sometimes, though, it may be because you had a perception of mind, and the perception happened to pass away. And before you picked it up again, you might notice, okay, there's a sense of ease that wasn't there when the perception was in place. Because what you're trying to do here is figure out what aggregates are you clinging to, or what types of aggregates are you clinging to. Are they perceptions? Are they thoughts? Are they feelings? Then you're going to ask yourself, why would you want to cling to them? This is where you begin to see the cause of the suffering. Well, again, you may have certain perceptions about your perceptions, perceptions about your, your feelings. These things can have many layers, which is why comprehending suffering is not something you might do in just one hour of meditation. It takes time to ferret these things out. And it's when you see precisely where you're clinging that you can begin to understand okay, exactly what kind of craving is driving that clinging. Because craving has a location, but it often lies about its location. We may tell ourselves we crave X, but we actually crave an idea about X, or have something we would like to see happen to X, have X be something different from what it is. And unless you can pinpoint precisely it is what you're clinging to, then you're not going to see precisely where you're craving. And when you don't see precisely where you're craving, you can talk about how craving is the cause for suffering, but not know anything at all about what's actually going on in your mind. You have to see the specifics. You have to see the de details. It's this act of clinging, this act of craving. Once you can pinpoint the clinging. And you have a better idea of what kind of craving it is you're dealing with. And that's what you let go. So these duties are all connected. It's simply a question of learning what it is that the duty entails. Comprehending suffering is not simply acknowledging, okay, there it is, there it is, that's suffering. Ask yourself well, precisely how is the mind suffering? And what acts of mind are you clinging to that keep the suffering going? And how can you see that they're really not worth it? That's where the three perceptions come in. I received a letter recently from someone who's been sick for the past couple of weeks, and she had gotten in her head somehow that she shouldn't be analyzing things in terms of the three, three perceptions. That she should be analyzing in terms of the Four Noble Truths instead. Well, the Four Noble Truths form the context for what we're doing. But then we bring in those three perceptions, inconstancy, stress, not self, where they can be useful to help us 
see that the things we're clinging to are not worth it, or the things that we crave. Things are a certain way. We want them to be another way. Well, the way they're, they are right now, maybe suffering the way we would like them to be, well, it may, you get what you crave sometimes, and then it's still going to be suffering. So you have to see these things are not worth holding on to. Because whatever way you want to analyze these things it has to come down to seeing it's not worth clinging to, it's not worth craving. Either because it's not under your control, because it's because it changes, or because it's stressful, or for any other reason. That's just not worth the energy that goes into it. That's when you let go. It's a value judgment. You see that you've been holding on to something. It's not worth holding on to. The image the Buddha gives is of a blind man who has been given a piece of cloth. It's a dirty old rag. But he's told this is a nice white piece of cloth. Take good care of it. It looks really good on you. So he's very protective of it, takes good care of it, thinking he has a nice white cloth to wear. And then his friends and relatives take him to a doctor who can cure his blindness. He looks at the rag and says, this is not what I thought it was. He lets it go. And that's what clinging comes down to. You're clinging to something. You think it's one thing, but it's actually something else. You think you're clinging to it because it's going to be worth clinging to. But then when you realize it's ephemeral, there's stress involved in it, it doesn't lie under your control, and you have better options. That's the other part of letting go. There are better options, better ways of finding happiness. So this is how you go about comprehending suffering. Your duty with the first noble truth. But as you can see, it involves engaging the other duties as well. So this is the Buddha's most basic teaching, the duties of the Four Noble Truths. They tell us what to do. They give us guidance. And it's simply a matter of learning how to tease out precisely what those instructions mean. And a good first step in that is figuring out, well, what are these five aggregates the Buddha is talking about? Well, you get the mind into concentration. And you're going to see them in action, and you're going to see how you learn to do them skillfully. And the more skillfully you can do these aggregates, because they're, they are actions, they're not things, the more skillfully you can do them, the more you're going to understand them. You don't let go just because the books tell you to let go. You let go because you've made them as good as you can make them. And they lead you to a place where you realize that there's something better.